on air button or something. I did. Maybe? I just pressed it. So we should be, but it's not showing up on YouTube. Oh, maybe. oh, maybe because you created an event, so oh, it'll it automatically is. it'll automatically wait till the time. <laughs> Oh, got it. Okay, so yeah. yeah. yeah All yeah, right, yeah. great. Well, hey everyone, welcome to Bionic Bud Podcast. Bionic Bud Podcast. You're listening to a special episode live on YouTube. I'm Natasha Bajma, your host, fiction author, national security expert, and futurist. Before we get started, um, I need to offer a disclaimer. My opinions that I offer are my own. They do not represent the views of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or National Defense University. And for those of you ha who have listened before, this is a bit of a departure from the usual program. Usually I talk tech news, read from my book, and give some behind the scenes information. But today I have a special guest um, and we'll be doing a brief uh, Q&A after our chat. So please save your questions until we get to that point. Um, otherwise they might get buried, but we'll see. Um, so today I'm here with a special guest uh, and biohacker, Dr. Josiah Zayner, CEO and founder of The Odin startup company aiming to make science and genetic engineering accessible and affordable. Josiah, welcome to the show. Yeah, you know what? Like a lot of people just start calling me doctor a lot more lately. Oh, and, really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to make up pretty, for the stripping of your title? It's, it's pretty funny. No, I don't know why, but uh, I think it's people outside of the academic realm. You know, that's where I've spent most of my time. They're, they're more inclined to call people with PhDs doctor. So now whenever I'm doing these things, it's always like, hey, Dr. Josiah. And I'm like, it just makes me laugh. <laughs> I appreciate the honorific. We have to make up for the New York Times, you know, whatever we can. Um, so <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I saw your, fa your post on Facebook where you talked about your passion for storytelling. And you basically said that if people don't relate to you, then it doesn't matter what you're doing. And you called story uh, your your secret weapon. So I'm curious uh, how you use story. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, you're obviously very familiar with stories being an author and uh, writing a lot yourself. The thing is, is that human beings, people, we connect with each other through stories. It's how we think, it's how we, how we do everything. Um, and I was just listening to, uh, Steve Martin. You know Steve Martin, the uh, comedian? Yes. Um, listening to his autobiography and he was, he said something brilliant this morning is that like life and like the most greatest moments in life are like tension, you know, uh, tension followed by relief. And that's kind of what makes comedy. That's what makes stories and things like that. And uh, it just, it really spoke to me in that like everything we talk about, everything we do, you know, we need to engage people and we need to engage people with this kind of like mindset of how do I bring that tension to make them excited and, you know, want to listen and then bring that relief. So it's actually a story and it just doesn't leave them feeling miserable because they have all this pent up tension that they can't release. <laughs> but in life, you know, in running a business and marketing and all these things, it's it's constantly storytelling. It's constantly bringing that tension to people, and then releasing it. Um, yeah, you're yeah. absolutely you're right. I mean, if if you don't hook people to begin, then you you really have nowhere else to go um, with what it whatever it is you're you're doing. I know. So, like, well, one thing that I always think about is, I'm not a good writer. So, like, when you write your stories. How do you start them? Or like, do you just like get an idea and kind of go with it? Or like, where do your stories come from? Yeah, so I mean, I I get an idea and it kind of sticks with me and I kind of see a story growing from there. So my first mystery novel, Bionic Bug, I was doing research for work. I am running a project on emerging technologies and looking at the impact of emerging technologies on WMD, weapons of mass destruction. And I came across this MIT Technology Review article about this beetle that had this microelectronics package uh, attached to it, and they were using it to control its flight. And it really kind of um, set off my imagination. And I, that was back in 2009. So the research has continued a lot more from there. 
But of course, my mind went to, oh, swarm of bionic bugs. And so that's kind of where that story started up. Yeah. Yeah. You just like, what's your creative process for like developing these stories? Like what, what, what gets you thinking about it? Well, I start off with an idea like that. So that's kind of the hook for me, that an original idea. And then it's really about character. So it's about people and about their story and how they react to the situation that they're thrown in. I think that's similar to how, you know, we're thrown into this thing called life and it deals us all sorts of ups and downs and our character is expressed through how we react to those situations. And so, so I think that that's what drops, draws people in. How much of you is like, in, is there like, is the main character like based off you or how much of you do you put in there? <laughs> <laughs> My main character, Lara Kingsley, is not me. She is a special forces <laughs> operator in the National Guard, and I am not athletic at all. Um, uh, so I've, I live vicariously through her. But there are aspects. I mean, I think, you know, I'm writing a strong female protagonist. Um, I've been working in Washington, D.C. for 10 years now, and it's it's a hard place to work. I call it a rat race or drama city. Pick your, pick your, your title. <laughs> And, um, you know, so a lot of kind of, I, I've been hardened through that process. So I kind of have some of that in Lars' character. So there's definitely some of me, but I not all there. Because I'm, I'm going to be writing other characters. So I have to save some other things. <laughs> for, for the future. Yes, for other characters. <laughs> you, got, you got a little party in each one of them. Yeah, no, that's what's interesting. Like, so I don't write stories, but... I kind of tell a story or try to tell a story through myself or, you know, through the things I do and what I project and, and put online. So I kind of become that story or, or I am the story. My life is the story. And so it's like, it is me, but it's also a character, which is like hard for people to see. Sometimes um, people like to believe that like, Oh, Josiah is fun and crazy all the time. No, I'm like a normal person. Sometimes I just like to sit there and, you know, watch TV and eat, you know, rice and chicken. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, when we're in the public eye or in a high tension situation, we do play a role. I mean, we, we are characters. Totally. You can't be your authentic self. I certainly can't be my authentic self in the workplace. Um, Nor do you really want to be usually. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to hear the stupid stuff that I say. So Except speaking, for my employees. <laughs> speaking of you being the story, you are a story, and um, the New York Times recently reminded us of part of your story. Um, they reported on the DIY bio, bio community and pretty much suggested that biohackers are a threat to national security. What do you think? So you did a study first, you did a study on like emerging technologies and WMD. What did you find were like the biggest threats? Well, I mean, I think drones, to be honest, I think that is oh, the really? biggest threat by far right now that we face because they are cheap. They are extremely powerful platforms. You can go buy them on Amazon. Um, they're becoming more powerful all the time. And, and I, I personally, that's the one that I feel most pressing. I did, of course, look at synthetic biology and CRISPR. And I, I'm curious to hear what you think. But my general impression is that CRISPR without knowledge is kind of just a, a tool. And we really need the knowledge about gene sequences and genomes and what sequences code for what functions before we can actually leverage the power of that tool. Well, not just that. Here's the idea. It's like people don't understand genetic engineering and synthetic biology. So they think like a single individual could do all this stuff. But it's kind of similar to saying, well, this single carpenter is going to build a palace or build the White House or a mansion. And when you think about that, you think, well, obviously that's ridiculous. If a single person tried to build a, a, a palace or a mansion, it would take them 50 years, 100 years, they wouldn't be able to do it in any reasonable time frame with any reasonable, you know, like way. And it's kind of similar with genetic engineering and synthetic biology is that there is such an activation energy required for people to do bad stuff 
It requires so much knowledge, so much skill, so much time, so much effort that like you need a lot of money, a lot of people that it just wouldn't be something that would be easy to do like clandestine or something. Mm-hmm. Unless you're like, you know, a government and you have a secret lab or some, something. But like an individual, it'd be, it'd be you know, really hard, almost impossible for an individual to actually hurt more people than say like a knife. That's, yeah. that's, that's pretty hard. So I, I heard you mention in, I think it was, it might've been an interview with Reason TV um, that, you know, you have a PhD in biophysics and you find it difficult to do the simplest things with CRISPR. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not necessarily that CRISPR is like so difficult. It's that, it's like, if I teach you how to make an LED blink, or teach you how to do some basic computer programming. That's, you know, anybody can learn how to do that. But then if I say, I want you to program this operating system from scratch, there are very few people who can do that. So it's like the level, it's the level of knowledge that is required. It's not that people can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's not that tools aren't getting better. It's just that like, just like I have no idea what, how to write a book or what's going on in, you know, the WMD world and all the stuff you do, I would start off as like the biggest noob ever. And I wouldn't be able to do the things that you do or some other expert does. That's it. It's just, it requires an expert knowledge. And, you know, usually people go to school for like six years to learn how to do that Mm -hmm. stuff. And that's a, a lot of time. But as I understand it, it's not just like, you know, book knowledge, it's actually experiential knowledge. Like you have to be in the lab working with the tools, understanding. Yeah, that's one of the interesting things about like genetic engineering and, you know, synthetic biology and stuff like that is that it, it's one of those strange intellectual disciplines that still also requires a certain amount of hand-eye coordination. <laughs> <laughs> like if you don't know how to pipette, you won't be able to do genetic modification. And uh, it's something that you have to learn how to do. And people are always asking me like, what books do I read? What, how do I learn how to do this stuff? And I say, it's, it's not in the books. It's like, would you read a book to learn how to play the guitar? I mean, I'm sure some nerds really would <laughs> and maybe myself, <laughs> but no, you got to buy a guitar and you got to pick up the guitar and you got to play it. That's the only way you're going to learn to do it. And it's the same way with genetic engineering and why, we have the company, you know, the Odin that I run is because mm-hmm. we are trying to give people inexpensively the tools so that they can learn how to do this stuff. Because if you don't get your hands on it, you, you can't learn to do it. It's just like, I'm sure with writing, right? Like if you don't write, you're not going to learn how to write. Oh, absolutely. And I, I believe that anybody can learn to become a better writer, but it does require um, discipline sitting down in, you know, the seat and writing. Um, my boss asked me a couple of weeks ago, he's like, well, how do we make, you know, people better writers? And I said, practice. And I said, <laughs> I write 2000 words a night when I get home. You know, I, that, yeah. that, you know, I come in in the morning and I'm ready to go. I know how to write. I know how to put words on paper. And, but if I stopped writing, if I took a pause for a month or so, and I tried to get back in the seat again to rev back up, it would take all that practice again. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I believe it. And that's the thing with a lot of these things is it does take practice. And it's not just like, I mean, it's starting to become more automated where you can go online and like use a program to, you know, order some DNA or something. You don't really need to know much about it, but it's extremely limited with the things you can do because w- with that, it, uh, if you actually want to do something that's not been documented before, it does take a bit of like knowledge on the, the topic. Um, so do you think there's what, a market for consumer genetic engineering? I mean, that's what I, I do. That's why I run this business. That's why I do what I do is because I think that, you, know, you look at genetic engineering, it is literally, I think, one of the most powerful technologies we know of, right? You can take living organisms, which are basically self-replicating matter, and you could you know, 
coax them to do things. I won't say programming because I hate when people use programming because you're not programming biology. It's like so much more complicated than that. But you can kind of coax it along mm -hmm. to do things. And uh, so many op opportunities and potential there, right? In medicine, in uh, you know, food and fuels, energy, right? Making biofuels and things like that. Uh, you know, engineering crops and just doing crazy and interesting stuff, engineering animals, new pets, maybe some dragons or something like <laughs> it opens up so many opportunities that we don't think of or experience. And you're just like, I don't know where this is going to go. Right. I don't know what people are going to be doing with this stuff in 10 years, but also like, how will it not be a thing? Like you said, you know, drones, it's such an interesting technology because people have never had the opportunity to be able to fly like an aircraft for inexpensive that like can actually carry things. Exactly. Know? So I was, I, I, I like to say that for the first time ever, anyone can project power into the air with a drone. It's almost like, and if you could cut, basically swarm a couple of drones, you could have your own little tiny air force. And that is fundamentally going to change everything. Wow. Yeah. That's a really interesting idea to think about. That is crazy, right? It's like, whoa. Yeah, well, we I predict get... I predict we'll see drone delivery before we see um, self-driving cars. I think drone oh, delivery wow. is is closer. Um, there was an um, unmanned uh, aerial vehicle effort put out by the uh, current administration uh, where they're allowing for 10 experiments that go beyond the current guidelines, um, which kind of limit how you can fly drones, where you can fly drones. And um, Uber, for example, is testing out flying taxis. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, that's crazy. Yeah. No. I mean, <laughs> with with the synthetic biology and genetic engineering, I, I I see it the same way. It's like this new technology that's just being opened up to the public, and we don't know where it's going to go yet. Like drones, right now, um, it has gone a lot of different places. A lot, you know, people just use it for fun. People race them. People use them to take pictures and movies. And people use them as weapons. And it's like, who knows? What this, is this going to literally become our new, uh, you know, like delivery system? It, it might. And like you think it probably will. And with genetic engineering, it's just getting started. So I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but it's going to be something. Mm -hmm. And... Getting it into the hands of the people, I think, is the first step with, with any new technology. So there are often analogies between the start of the computing industry and genetic engineering. I think you've made them, others have made them, and I'm just thinking about... So one of the reasons I went on my own rant against the New York Times article, and I'm so passionate about this myself, is that my parents were computer programmers in the 80s, and they were self-taught. They had a BA in math, and that's it. And my dad saw this computing thing going on and he's like, let's get into that. And so both my mom and he became computer programmers. They started up their own companies from their garages, but not really in the garage. Mm -hmm. And um, they basically made a living for our family and that's the foundation for my success. So I, I see similarities here. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I hate myself for making those analogies because <laughs> I, I think there's, there's so many different, it's hard to like, you know, say one thing is like another because there's so many idiosyncrasies in each thing, but I do see also a lot of, of similarities. I didn't grow up, um, you know, doing that stuff. It was probably in the 90s where I started to use computers, but when the internet was really starting to get popular and I, I really saw the power that it had when people had access to the, the tools to use it, right? When people could program, when people were given the knowledge when, you know, the internet was kind of built to kind of democratize all this stuff. It's crazy right now, but like in the beginning, it was just about having the knowledge. If you had the knowledge, you could do basically whatever you wanted. And imagine and, uh, the government had stepped in and controlled that and shut that down. So, you know, we see a lot of fear being generated by New York Times type articles about the DIY bio community. I mean, how do you counter that? You know what? I, I think it's just part of any new technology, right? And uh, I think it, it's people like you who are the ones who need to counter it the most because, you know, 
you're the ones who are studying all these emerging technologies and influencing the effect that it will actually have on people. But it's like whenever any new technology comes out, uh, people get super scared of it, right? Uh, I mean, all the way back to like the printing press and, and the automobile <laughs> and the airplane and electricity. And then you go up to like the 3D printer and, you know, everybody's scared of everything until it starts to become commonplace. Like now we plug stuff into electric outlets without even thinking about getting shocked. Right. It's like, <laughs> nobody knows anybody really that's died from like electric shock anymore. It's just like, well, we, I think about it. I almost got electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I definitely get electrocuted doing stupid stuff. Sometimes. Oh, I didn't do stupid <laughs> stuff, but. <laughs> you did it? What you, what no, happened? I was 13. So I, you know, we were connected, we were camping in Colorado and my parents were connecting our camper to this, this outlet that's high voltage and it was connected to another RV and apparently their wiring was bad. And so it made our entire camper hot and we had this nice iron stair case and everybody was wearing sneakers and I had taken off my sneakers and I stood onto that stair, grabbed the side of the doors and I connected the circuit. Um, and apparently my body did fun things. And I, I remember not being able to see very well. I was screaming, but I couldn't hear myself. Um, but I definitely felt the the zap for several minutes until my mom. <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> like, a, uh, you know, like a freak accident. Right. Some might say it explains everything. <laughs> this is so, not like an everyday life type of no, thing. No, no. And that's what I'm saying. It's like we use it so much now that like we don't even think about it. And I think that's just same with computers, right? It's uh, people once thought they would be, you know, I'm sure they were studied as a weapon of mass destruction themselves at, at some point in time. <laughs> like you know, people I are going to use computers to... I don't think people Take really off. notice. So I think the difference between the rise of computing and genetic engineering is just our connectedness. So computing, you know, I saw the internet when it was like a list of links on Yahoo and my dad showed it to me. I think I was like 11 or something. And he showed it to me, he's like, isn't this cool? And I'm like, I clicked on the links and like, no, it's kind of lame actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, going back to the um, idea that, you know, I'm part of the, the solution to counter kind of our fears about genetic engineering. I agree with that, but I also see um, controlling your own narrative as a really important thing to do in this digital age. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, why the DIY bio community isn't doing more to kind of put out their own narrative. I know you are, but I mean, as a whole. Um, Honestly, the, the narrative doesn't bother me as much. The, the narrative of like scare, people being scared of it and fear, it almost like is encouraging because it's like, it means people are actually experiencing it and thinking about it and people are talking about it. And there's two options, right? One option is that somehow people get so afraid that it becomes regulated. And the other option is basically like nobody really cares. People get over their fears and think life moves on. Well, number the things getting regulated, I think is, it's really difficult. The government moves so slow on a lot of these things that like, it's already permeated the ecosystem enough that if, if they were like, Oh, people can't, genetically modify stuff in their homes, everybody would be like, well, you know, it's already spread to 30,000, 50,000, 100,000 homes in the U.S. What are we going to do, right? Are we just going to you know, tell these people that they can't do it anymore? What if they do do it? Are we going to like bust down their door and like arrest them, right? And it's like, it's probably not going to happen. They're probably not going to start busting down doors and arresting people for genetic modification. So to me, that people are, you know, thinking about it, afraid of it, almost adds to the excitement of it. And I know it sounds terrible, but it's like, people are like, what is that? I want, I want to try that. I want to see what's going on with that. What, what all the, you know, excitement is about. Okay, so you're of the mind that bad press is good press then. <laughs> To, to a large extent, right? I mean, there are certain things you can do that are really negative, um, you know, that you can like never, you know, things like Harvey Weinstein, where it's just like, 
it's not good press at all. <laughs> Never will be good press, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in general, when people are just talking about hypotheticals and typing, talking about things like that, I, I say it's great that they're just actually talking about it. And it's mm -hmm. great that people are like, when somebody feels an emotion towards something, I think that is like the, the best part of the story, right? Oh yeah. It's like we, we, whether you're afraid, whether you're happy, whether you're, you know, angry, all these emotions, when you feel one of those, the story is good. Well, why do people feel thrillers? Why read thrillers? Why do they watch, read horror uh, stories? I think people like the, the feeling of being afraid. It's exciting. At, yeah, no, and I think it's good, you know, with the biohacking, DIY bio, whatever. I think people, you know, being like, wow, this thing is so powerful. It could, you know, turn, have, cause a zombie apocalypse or something. Like, to me, that's exciting. Obviously, <laughs> that, that will never happen, right? It's just, like, not theoretically possible. But it's exciting to, like, that people are, you know, being, expressing this, thinking about it enough that they're feeling these things. And so I, I, I tend to not be somebody who who fights against it too much, who, uh, hey, I'll, I'll definitely show people the good side of it and try to talk about the good side. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, people are going to get hurt eventually. I, I, I think I'm a firm believer in that, that like somebody is eventually going to do something with every technology, right? you know, computers, everything, something bad happens eventually. People do stupid shit. They, you know, break laws, they do all sorts of things. And I wanted to come back to the whole regulation thing, because I think you're absolutely right. Um, the cat is kind of out of the bag. And if you look at the drone situation, um, people were flying drones that they bought on Amazon years before finally the FAA got involved. And so they came out, I think it was 2016, with what they call the small drone rule. And they required all drones of a certain size um, they had to be not little toys, but, you know, certain size, like the the Phantom, the DJI Phantom drones, things like that. You had to register them. So you had to pay a $5 fee, you had to get a number, and then you would affix the number to the to the drone, and you were good. That was the law at the time. But the, the interesting thing about that is, do you think people who have bad intentions are going to register their drones? <laughs> no, no, exactly, right? And or people really care. It's like, that's the problem, I think, with a lot of this stuff is the regulation isn't going to you know, stop the bad people from doing something bad. It most likely just hinders the good people from enjoying themselves in some way. And uh, with biohacking, I, I think it's really similar because I think it's hard to do bad stuff. And somebody's going to do bad stuff, whether it's with, you know, genetic engineering or something else. You think that like, if they really want to hurt people and uh, they can't figure out a way to do it with genetic engineering, they're not just going to go buy a, a knife or a gun or, or try to do something like that that way. I, I think that's what would happen. I think, you know, trying to hurt somebody with genetic engineering is a lot more difficult because it's, it's not like a gun where you can go and like shoot somebody and they die. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to, this has to be like, well thought out. If I want to like kill somebody, I have to like, either make them drink some liquid that I poison or like spread some virus all over their house or, or someplace where they frequent <laughs> like, and, and then try to make sure that they get infected and it lasts for at least a few days and they don't go to the hospital. It's like, this is like, you know, some serious messed up shit here. So as a fiction writer who dreams up these lovely scenarios, there's a lot easier <laughs> ways to kill people. And I, have you heard of the group um, Shinrikyo? Probably not. No, what they're is this? a Japanese cult back in the 1990s, and um, they're well known for a uh, chemical weapons attack that they did in the Tokyo subway oh, yeah, in 1995. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, they experimented with biological weapons, and you'll find this really funny. So it's kind of in 1990 when the group leader 
wanted to kill a lawyer that was representing some of their group members because basically the members, when they would join the group, they would give all their assets over and the family members really thought this was crazy. And so they were trying to file a lawsuit against this group, um, Shinrikyo. And so there's a lawyer representing the family members and the leader of the group's like, I want to get rid of this guy. Let's try it with botulinum toxin. <laughs> and so they actually tried to go out and find a place where they could get the bacteria Clostridium botulinum. They isolated it from the soil. They took it back to the lab. They grew, they grew it up in the lab. And then they created this liquid concoction, like metric tons of this stuff. And one of their members fell in a vat and he didn't even get sick. <laughs> so, I mean, they have like a billion dollars worth of assets. They were, um, doing their activities in Japan, they were protected as a religious, you know, cult. They had 40,000 members and they couldn't even get it done. I know it's pretty funny. No, I mean, it really is it's really just like a very terrible way to try to hurt people. And, uh, I think the, the other thing though, is that you have to think about it in terms and sadly, you have to think about it in terms of like the benefit, right? If you, if you look at like automobiles, cars, um, how many people die all the time, right? Million, like over a million people die every year in the world in car accidents. But if you ask people if they're, they'd be willing to give up cars to like save these million, millions of lives, like I don't think anybody really would be. I mean, you'd, you'd have that one friend that we all, all have that would be like, I don't even ride cars anyway. I only use bikes. So <laughs> I already, I already, <laughs> I think the majority of people would be like, Ah, you know, the cars are really useful. And uh, I don't think we could like live without them. And so we sacrifice these millions of people every year to the gods of, you know, automobiles. And it's really sad, but it provides such a benefit that we, we've, you know, come to grips and come to understand that like, sometimes you have to make sacrifices for certain things. And with synthetic biology and genetic engineering, the benefits are so immense when you think about it. Uh, the benefits it can provide just to m medicine and agriculture and all these things. And even if there is a chance that people get harmed, even if people do get harmed, you know, we have to look at it from the point of view of we have never had the power over genetics that we have had like now. And the ability to use that to save people's lives is just, it's beyond what we've ever seen. And like, how do we not harness that? How do we not allow people to use that? Even if it means people getting hurt in the process. And I, I can't find a, a you know, as, as much as I care for human life and how beautiful and sacred it is. It's also just like, there are millions of people dying every day because they don't have medicine or don't have food. Those lives also need to be sacred. Well, I think, you know, part of the reason people get afraid about genetic engineering is they just don't understand it. And I think, you know, I think I, I, I forget which interview it was, but you were talking about how we modify our, our DNA all the time through our environment and the things that we put in our body. And how is that different than modifying it for good? <laughs> it's, it's, it's because the government decides it's different or not, right? <laughs> right. So, um, so it's I think just like, uh, gosh, yeah, no regulation is, a. Uh, I was, I was thinking about that. Like, uh, this morning I was thinking a, a lot about regulation and like, what, you know, would you, what would you be willing to go to jail for? Like, say they said you can no longer own a pipette or something you would go to jail or no longer do genetic engineering. Does like the pipette, you know, as a symbol or just in general, does it, is it outside the bounds of regulation? Should it be something that like is a basic human right that like you try to regulate me, you try to regulate me doing genetic modification. Like you can't, you can't stop me. I'm going to do it anyway. Even if it means going to jail, even if it means like, uh, you know, you try to arrest me. Um, well, the problem with that yeah. type of regulation is, is that is the, the problem of enforcement, even if the government came up with laws that were that draconian, 
how in the world where they go around from house to house checking for pipettes? I mean, are there not other things we should be worried about? Yeah, I know. They don't even go house to house checking for like, you know, hand grenades and shit. <laughs> <laughs> or illegal weapons. <laughs> yeah, right? So it's like, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I don't know. And uh, I, I think we're actually in a really good environment here in the U.S. I think the government is really exceptional in the fact to how open they are to uh, genetic engineering and synthetic biology. And I don't know why. I don't know why, because the U.S. seems to be fairly, eh, North America in general, seems to be fairly unique in these aspects um, compared to the rest of the world in regards to genetic modification. And uh, it's it's really awesome, I think. I think it's really amazing. And I, think I don't think... I mean, freedom of action comes from our, our very special history. I think, you know, that it's protected in the Constitution. I think as, as a result, we've been incredibly innovative as a country. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's it's amazing. And I, I don't think it will change. And I think people, you know, like the New York Times and places like that, they're just trying to sell clicks and, you know, trying to sell their story and stuff. So they got to they got to cause a little tension. Right. Because the tension and I don't know if you've noticed, but like a couple of people wrote articles like responding to that story. And it's like it's it definitely caused some tension. And I, I find it really, uh, uh, really entertaining. And that's that's the purpose of these <laughs> things. Right. They're stories. Sure. They're, enter they're entertainment. And like it has become entertaining. So let's talk about freaky frogs. So you're working on a frog project right now. Ooh, the freaky frogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, one of the projects we've been working on lately uh, due to popular demand is uh, our, our first products were mostly done in, you know, genetic modification done in microorganisms. The great thing about microorganisms is that they grow so fast, right? So you can get some yeast from the store and you could grow some up and in a few days you could do genetic modification, which is awesome. And it's really easy to tell. You, know, you can make them change color, glow, do whatever. Really cool. But like, people are only so interested in yeast, even though they, uh, you know, you can make beer, you could make bread out of it. People are only so interested in yeast because they're not, uh, they're not like, interactive you know like an <laughs> animal and um so we decided to start to try to work with animals how can we bring animal level genetic engineering to people is is one of the big questions we've been seeking out in in a safe way in a way that's not regulated because a lot of animals are regulated right so uh, we can't allow people to genetically modify dogs and stuff like that because that that's like animal cruelty type stuff. Um, it's actually covered by the animal welfare act. So it's, it's been a, a process over the past six months or more trying to figure this whole thing out of you know, what animals do we use? How do we figure out a safe protocol that the animals won't be harmed, that people can learn how to do it and handle it and all this other stuff. And, we settled on frogs because they're really easy to work with. Um, they're really inexpensive. They're not regulated because they're, they're considered like a minor species by the FDA, um, which is like something that's not a, a pet or like a farm animal or doesn't go into our food supply technically, even though some people do eat frog. I don't think these frogs are big enough to really eat though. So how are you good. modifying the frogs? What are you doing to change them? Yeah, so the experiments we, we started with are using this gene called insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, which is expressed a lot in humans in puberty. It's what causes you to grow really big from uh, you know the protein being in your body, changing your metabolism and everything like that. So we are using it in adults to make them bigger so it's kind of like a genetic modification gene therapy to cause them to grow. It's really easy to see, measure, right? Um, and so it's you know a, a great 
first choice for us to try to experiment with. And um, we've had some early successes. We're just, we're trying to figure out all, everything that's needed so that people can do this safely and without harming the frog. So it's a lot of research and development that's gone into it. And I think we still got uh, a few more months left to go before anything like this is actually ready for the general public because uh, we don't want people just to do stuff willy nilly. I can't think of a better phrase and that one seems terrible, but <laughs> <laughs> we don't want people to do stuff just willy nilly, like even personal injections. You know, a lot of people started injecting themselves with DNA and I was like, whoa, whoa, whole hold on. Why did no they do that? Because people, <laughs> people are interested in like exploring the unknown, right? But the problem is with stuff like this, it's less like you know, strap me into the rocket, you know, I trust that you built it correctly and more like, I'm just going to eat this random plant that's growing and hope it doesn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think people need to take a step back and approach it a little more systematically so they don't hurt themselves. And so platforms like this, like frogs provide people the opportunity to not only not hurt themselves, but also to explore a lot of different medical and experimental things that have never been explored in science yet because they're a great platform for testing human genes and human responses to, to DNA. And um, yeah, I think it's really, really cool, really exciting. Cool. Well, we have our first question and it's from Karen. Do you expect that blogging, vlogging about DIY biogenetic engineering experiments would pique the public's interest? Well, uh, I guess I'll answer first. Um, yeah, I, obviously, I think every little bit helps. It's interesting because if you look six months ago, even, or a year ago on Twitter, and you looked at the hashtag biohacking, it was all about people who were you know, the people who take nootropics or like drugs or the people who put butter in their coffee and stuff like that. And you could do any of those things, like whatever you want. That's cool. But the form of biohacking that we generally do is, you know, genetic modification or human modification. And now if you look now, it's totally changed. A lot of the stories, a lot of the pe stuff people are tweeting about or talking about is more related to genetic modification or you know, human modification. And that's just because people, this is not like any companies or corporations. These are just people talking about people writing blogs, people uh, making YouTube videos, people posting on Twitter, people posting on Facebook. I think it reaches the public. Like, I don't think one person, myself or my company could ever have the impact that the people can, the community can. Mm -hmm. Communities are so strong. So one idea I had, and, and this goes back to kind of controlling the narrative, or at least, you know, kind of having your own narrative, um, especially this is my first time using YouTube. And it occurred to me that what if there was a DIY bio TV channel where scientists could kind of YouTube them, you know, kind of take video of themselves, introducing themselves, telling their story, showing the, the work that they're doing, explaining it. And I think, could that help the general public learn more and actually kind of generate more interest? Oh, of course. I'm sure that would generate tons of interest. And I think, as you know, the problems with all these things is just like having the time and people, effort, resources to actually get that stuff done. Because good luck trying to get like three people to do it, much less 30. Oh, you think <laughs> nobody would do it? No, not that they wouldn't do it. It's just like, it's hard to rally people behind causes right it's like all right i'm going to need you to make me a 10 minute video about you that your lab and the research you do and it's like two months later you're like hey can i get that video <laughs> yeah well <laughs> maybe somebody should do this i mean it's a diy project um maybe there's someone out there with video and editing skills that could help yeah or just people do it themselves you know i think like it's great you know, the stuff you do, you do a lot of outreach on social media and, you know, podcasts and on YouTube and stuff like that. And I think it people 
uh, overthink how much or don't understand how much impact they can have, especially with modern technology and social media and all these things. Um, you know, posting just a simple tweet or picture or message on all these platforms reaches so many people. It's insane. Thousands of people. Even if you think that you, you don't have a lot of friends and a lot of people don't listen to you, you'll still reach at least a thousand eyes. This is the crazy thing. So we do marketing for my company. And, uh, you know, we run ads on Google and Facebook and stuff like that. And generally, when you're paying for these ads, you're paying something like at least a dollar, maybe more for somebody to click on a link. So every time somebody clicks on a link in your ad, you're paying a dollar or more, right? Every single click that you make on the internet is worth at least a dollar to somebody. Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, right, that you posting something and people, you know, even seeing it, even if they don't click on it, and then if they click on it, it's like how much power that that is that people are willing to pay a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars for each one of those interactions. Like, it's just like, whoa. I people would post a lot more. I think they would be like posting all the time. Though those people get really annoying. <laughs> well, and that's, that's why I brought it up because in this age, it's, it's really easy to create a narrative for yourself. It wouldn't take a lot of effort if the, and, and what would be really great if there was somebody who was, you know, kind of centralizing that effort or, you know, kind of leading the effort, but you know, time is money, right? It's just, it's a lot of work. Yeah, no, totally. Looks like we got so, a question from Esther. We have another question from Esther Kim. Where they'll, will there be more modifications done on frogs other than making them larger? Yeah, the point I was trying to get to is jet fuel definitely doesn't melt steel beams. What did you say? <laughs> I said jet fuel doesn't melt steel beams. It was a, it was a joke. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So, Esther, you must... Uh, I'm so glad to see a message from you. You must be just starting out in this biology stuff. So I'll gladly answer your question. <laughs> I just see that. I know Esther. I'm just teasing with her. Oh, okay. um, um, will there be more modifications? I think the, 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 the goal of the frogs is that the options are almost endless. It's like a platform, right? What what I think a lot about is like, I don't know if you're familiar with like an Arduino or like little microcontrollers that people use for uh, electronics engineering. Yes. You know, with, with like one of these Arduinos or Raspberry Pis, you can like blink an LED, right? I can send you a kit, simple instructions on how to blink an LED. But that's not the cool thing about them. The cool thing about them is that you can like also build a robot that can like walk around and use computer vision to like look at things. And that's the kind of idea with a platform like these frogs is that yes, we are testing out experiments just to show that things work, that people can do stuff with them. But imagine trying to engineer these frogs to you know, grow wings or like, I don't know, become more intelligent or to me, there are just so many crazy things. Grow a tail. I don't know. There's so many interesting things and opportunities with this. And not just stuff like that, but also for like medical, you know, testing gene therapies out on these frogs. Oh, something like IGF-1 or, or other things like folostatin uh, could be things that could be used in muscular dystrophy, right? Testing out different forms of this gene therapy that work on these frogs. Like to me, that's astounding because, you know, there are very few treatments for stuff like muscular dystrophy right now. And having the opportunity to maybe contribute some knowledge by just working with something in your home to me is like so amazing. I just hope that more and more people can get access to it because the number of scientists that exist right now can't possibly study all this stuff. They just don't have the time and money and, you know, resources. Mm hmm. So going back to so writing and fiction, I'm curious, um, will it be possible for criminals to modify their DNA to get away with crimes in the future? 
Oh, I, I don't think you'd modify your DNA. I think the trick is, right? So normally when they're looking to identify criminals, they use the what, CODIS 13 alleles, um, maybe some other, I think some systems, have they been extended up like 16 or 18? I can't remember. But I know, yeah, I know they use the, these 13 alleles and they look at them to see the number of repeats that you have. Well, what you can do is instead of trying to modify your own DNA is just at crime scenes, plant so much exogenous DNA from so many different people that it's hard to identify which source the DNA is coming from. It, it, uh, that sounds easier. It, yeah. Right. Just like, Hey, I'm going to go to a bar and I'm just going to like, you know, take a bunch of DNA from a bunch of people mix it in a, a squirt bottle. And then after I go commit this crime, just squirt all this DNA everywhere, just in case, because they won't be able to tell the difference between my DNA and all these other people's DNA. It'll all be mixed and they'll just get these weird results. They'll never be able to identify any of us. And uh, <laughs> I'll get away. They won't have good DNA evidence. <laughs> So you mentioned the frogs project. Are there other things that you're doing in the near term? Oh gosh, uh, so much. We're, we're working a bit with plants. Um, they're a little slower, so they, they take a lot longer, which is funny. But uh, yeah, we've been working with plants, um, doing a lot of CRISPR stuff, trying to get CRISPR to work with frogs and plants. So. Uh, you know, in general, we're always trying to make things just more accessible. That's our main goal, figuring out how to take these uh, scientific um, scientific experiments or scientific uh, ideas that have only been used in research labs and break them down so that people can use them in their home. Yeah, Karen, we do plan on, on, on working with plants. We are starting to work with plants right now. Um, and work out all the general protocols and stuff so that it's uh, really easy to do. Uh, the, one, the one thing with plants is just that it takes about a few months for experimentation because it, you have to wait for the plant to grow. So things are really, really, really slow on the plant front, but definitely going. Great. Um, I saw that there's a biohacking conference coming up. Are you kind of behind that? Or are you speaking at it? Yeah, no, uh, we're behind that. So we run this biohacking conference. You should come out. Um, <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah. I think it's a bad weekend for me. Labor Day, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah it's Labor <laughs> Day weekend. Um, so it's August 30th and September 1st, maybe September 2nd also. Um, it's in Oakland, California, and it's it's going to be crazy. We, we have such a good time. It's just a lot of interesting people from you know, professors, bioethicists, biohackers, everybody you can imagine in the community coming together, trying to learn from each other, trying to challenge each other, good conversations, you know, lots of beer. It's, it's a good time. I saw, are you offering grants as well to people who are working? Yeah, no. Oh, that's amazing. That's one of the new things that we're trying to do. We really want to get people. The thing with biohackers is usually they fund themselves out of their own pocket, right? There's not a lot of opportunities for people to get external funding, which to me is just sucks because some of these people are trying to do some of the most innovative and, and crazy things. And, uh, you know, if I had a lot more money, I'd be throwing a lot more money to try to help out these people. But what we have managed to do is raise some money from some sponsors, some people who want to donate to these biohackers. And yeah, we're going to have, you know, right now we've raised a few thousand dollars that we're going to give away to people who have the best projects, the most interesting projects. And it, it's, I think, uh, amazing because uh, especially for people who just, don't have even like a bachelor's degree in science, you know, they try to write for a normal grant. They just get laughed at. But now we're providing these people with an opportunity that, you know, they haven't been trained in grant writing. They haven't been trained in like 
all this stuff that people have, but we still want them to have the same opportunities that normal scientists have. I think it's just so cool and amazing. I, I, I'm super excited about it. I mean, I, if, if I was the one receiving these grants, I think it would just be so awesome. Like, it's just like, what? A grant for a biohacker? I never thought I'd be able to get a grant. Like, mm -hmm. oh gosh, it's so cool. That's awesome. Um, so everyone that's August 31 through September one or two, Biohack the Planet Conference in Oakland. And we'll include the link in the show notes. So I think there was one other question from Karen. Do you think that yeah, one Karen. day people will be able to culture their own lab grown meat? <laughs> Maybe. One of the problems with lab grown meat is uh, it's, it's like, you can imagine trying to grow tissue it needs to be really sterile, right? Because think about if you took like a chicken breast and just left it out, out on the counter for a few days, what's going to happen is bacteria is going to grow on it. It's going to get nasty. You don't want to eat that. So one of the major problems with lab grown meat is trying to keep it sterile. And uh, a lot of these lab grown processes require the use of antibiotics and things like that. Like so much more so than factory farming even. So it's like, I don't know if we will get to the place, a reasonable place where people will want to grow it and or make it just because it's really hard to keep stuff sterile, to be able to have it grow for weeks on end, just sitting there. It's not like a plant where you can just like leave it and, uh, you know, it'll do fine. Like you said, with plants, you know, plant engineering, you're, you're saying with uh, these brassicaceae's or brassicas, the thing is, is we don't necessarily want to work with these model organisms that people have used because they're super boring. You know, Arabidopsis, like Arabidopsis has no uses. So it's, it's difficult for us to invest time and effort in because we're really focusing on how genetic engineering can be, actually be used, how people can use it not just how they can experiment with it. And so we focus more on plants that are actually edible or useful. Um, and so usually those take a, a lot more time and their processes are, are usually pretty less documented. Um, not a lot of documentation out there. So it takes a little bit longer to optimize everything. Do you run into trouble with the FDA with edible sorts of things? Uh, I mean, not if uh, the FDA is strange. So the FDA regulation, the regulation is based off of marketing of products. So there's two things. If you're not selling something, the FDA doesn't really care, no matter what it is. Number two, if you're not marketing it, right, if you're not marketing it for the use, it's hard for the FDA to do something with it. So like if I'm selling you a you know a carrot to use to feed your um fruit flies and it's genetically modified it's kind of outside the realm of the fda um obviously you know if they're like well people are buying it to eat it they can kind of regulate you but it's 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 more about the appearance how are you marketing it and who are you selling it to or are you selling it that really breaks down the FDA regulation. So you can provide people the chance to do experiments with this stuff. As long as you're not promoting like, here's a genetically modified plant, go and eat it and go and spread the crop everywhere. <laughs> um, but I think that's going to change a lot because with the advent of people doing this stuff in the home, it's going to be a lot harder to regulate. It's mm -hmm. going to be a lot, lot harder because like, how do you stop people from sending seeds to their friends? Like, it's very expensive. They're not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any final words, anything you want to plug for the Odin? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, not, not really. Uh, I think I did a, a plenty of plugging. All right. Great. <laughs> how about you? How about you? What well, do you got? Well, when, uh... Sure. I mean, if you like uh, mystery novels that focus on technology, you should check out my new series. It's called the Laura Kingsley series. The first book, Bionic Bug, is out on Kobo. 
And that's at www.kobo.com forward slash ebooks forward slash bionic dash bug, I think. Uh, or you can find it on my website. So, sure. um, <laughs> and I'm working on Project Echo, the second book right now. And um, Josiah, you'll be interested to hear that I have a character in there, a nanoscientist named Clay Sterling, who works at a nano lab at George Mason University. This is all fictional. Um, and he really wants to bring nanotechnology to the masses. And so he's developed a mm -hmm. nanotechnology kit that he wants to sell to the masses. You can guess where I got the inspiration from. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> so any, any other spoilers for your new book? Spoilers for the new book? Um, well, let's see. There's um, an invisibility cloak in there. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are gecko gloves. Oh, that's really cool. In I there. Um, and uh, these neural... Frog, these frogs we work with, they can just, like, stick to anything with their, Yeah, like, what's feet. really cool, so they have nanoscale uh, hairs on their feet, geckos do, and it's really the friction of all of those millions of hairs that allows them to kind of stick and unstick, and obviously all the adhesives that we as, you know, scientists have come up, I'm not a scientist, but scientists have come up with are really difficult to stick and unstick. And so they're borrowing that um, ability from the geckos and, and developing uh, a nano adhesive that allows basically people to potentially scale buildings. So that combined with an exoskeleton, because I know you're a rock climber, but I'm not. So I'm going to need the help of an exoskeleton if I'm using. No, the I gloves. want it also. I think that would be really cool. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I also have um, ne neural implants. So this one is heavily Whoa. nano, um, a little neural implants. And so I'm only talking tech. I'm not going to give you any spoilers on the mystery, but um, right. I'm in the editing phase on that. So cool. Exciting. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show and for spending time with us this evening. And do you have uh, work yet to do in the lab? Yeah. We'll finish up some work today. All righty. Well, we'll let you get back to it, but thanks again. Yeah, it was nice chatting with you. All right. See you later. Yeah.